Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. Welcome to the latest episode of The Invisible Men. My name is Ian Rowe, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And I'm Nike Fajors, a member of the Leadership Network at AEI. Nike, it is great to see you as always in our quest to feature amazing black men that more people in our country need to know. And I'm very honored to say that we are joined today by Camille Foster, who has many claims to fame, but uh, founded a company, a media company called Freethink, and has one of the most influential podcasts, The Fifth Column. Like that description. Thank yes, you. yes, yes, yes. So I can't uh, wait to get into it with you. But for the folks who watch The Invisible, Invisible Men, you may notice that we have a, a different backdrop. And uh, Nike, we are at the old Parkland Conference uh, in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and this has just been an amazing uh, organization over the last three days. We've had researchers, practitioners, activists, all focused on this question of how do we achieve greater uplift, particularly in the black community. It was a homage to a conference that the economist Thomas Sowell uh, held 40 years ago in, uh, in San Francisco because of the frustration with the progress of the black community at the time. And many of the issues that existed then still do exist, even though there has been tremendous progress. And so I'm curious, both Camille and you, before Camille, we get into your story, what are some of the things that you learned uh, this weekend, inspired by, you know, what brought you here? Well, first of all, I, I have to thank you for the invitation. Um, you reached out to me and, and talked to me about this conference. And having looked into it a bit, I got, I got pretty excited about the opportunity to participate in something so obviously historic and of, of meaningful significance and about issues that I, I spend a great deal of time thinking about, about race, identity, about its, its intersection with various public policy issues, um, and about the need, in my estimation, for us to think more deeply about what what these ideas mean what what is race um how does it how does it intersect with our own lives um, but also what is the ideology of race and how have we kind of reconciled ourselves to it are we scrutinizing it sufficiently is there more that we can do to unpack this idea in order to to achieve progress in improving the state of people's lives yes and why do we always seem to reify race particularly in negative ways that continue to divide us mm -hmm. Um, Nike, I'm curious, any, any reflections of, of what you found most interesting about these last three days? Absolutely. I think uh, it, it starts with a, a joy in my heart in, in seeing the, the honest discussion, mm -hmm. the debate, the intellectual capabilities of, of the people in attendance, and the passion for results that everyone at the conference had, uh, which I have high expectations for in terms of those results. I think you know, probably the, the most sobering fact was the the idea that what was discussed 40 years ago as problem areas as, as points of of serious reflection have become larger problem areas and remain mostly just points of serious reflection there, there, there's not been significant progress in some of the some of the areas of weakness as it relates to race community uh, urban versus rural those sorts of matters but without a doubt i i feel there's momentum there's progress there's commitment uh and there's the intellectual backbone to to make the next 40 years a, a significant opportunity for progress wow well camille thank you so much for joining us you know we'd love to just get a sense of who you are i mean you're this pretty you know pretty cool guy right now i saw you on <laughs> bill maher a couple of months ago you know you've you are making moves and the messages that you are uh talking about are very very powerful but before we even get there tell us a little bit about your younger story and if there were any experiences particularly related to race this concept mm -hmm that were meaningful in your development, positive or negative, that started to give you a sense of just who you were, who you are. Yeah, well, I, like you, Ian, um, first-generation American, my family uh, came here from Jamaica 
and my mother arrived here. I was in utero, so I was born here in this country. And my earliest recollection of race is hearing my family talk about race uh, and hearing them refer to us and them. Mm. And the unique quality, which I know that you'll understand, is that it was never obvious whether they were talking about white people or black people. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Because I, I was always given a very clear sense that you know you don't fit into any kind of racial binary in an American context. And I will say that, you know, living in this country and going matriculating through public schools, I do think I, I learned race, but I was fortunate to encounter uh, fearless thinkers, people like Zora Neale Hurston, who has this really stirring passage about race pride um, and about uh, racial awareness and how she felt about it. Um, and the, the kind of the, the critical passage there is uh, about how race pride in her had to go, how she viewed race pride as a sapping vice. And I think I've always experienced a kind of tension between my determination to 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 secure the kind of dignity of my individualness and to not have other people place their expectations on me or confine me or define me um, on the basis of something as kind of frivolous as my phenotypic traits um, and um, I, I think people like Zora Neale um, and quite frankly other other great thinkers folks who were here this weekend um, have given me the the confidence to try and find my own way to think about these issues and to, to kind of reimagine what might be possible it, it, it is interesting we do share Jamaican heritage my dad you know who grew up in Jamaica uh, he always used to tell us I shared this with you earlier that he said I am a man in mm -hmm. Jamaica I am a man and it wasn't until the, he came to the United States where he had this realization, I am a black man. What do you think that does to someone who, we live in a country where you're, you're thrust into this identity mm -hmm. that you have no control over. It comes with all of whatever baggage that that means. What do you think that does to a young person? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think, there is certain, it's certainly the case that if I had been born in the 1960s or the 1970s, I'd have a very different relationship with race than I do someone who was born in the 1980s and who is sitting here now talking to you in 2022. And in 2022, for someone to insist that I am black, for someone to, to suspect that I myself have to embrace that particular identity um, is something that I find like pretty awkward and strange. Um, I I've heard people like Barack Obama, for example, say that there are as many ways to be black as there are black people. And if we're going to take an idea like that seriously, if we believe that, then we actually arrive at a place where this, this concept becomes something pretty, pretty frivolous. That's actually a beautiful statement. I don't think I've ever heard that Barack Obama said that. Yeah, no, he did. Um, Torrey also used it in his book. Um, but, but if that's the case, then it, it actually sounds like something that we might actually be able to do without. Um, and I very much believe that it is. We know that race doesn't have this, this kind of definite biological or genetic reality, in which case it's not merely that it's a social construct. It's a, it's a kind of ideological commitment. And ideological commitments like, actually have baggage associated with them. And if we're unwilling to scrutinize that baggage and to think deeply about what racing ourselves about what imagining the world first and foremost or whenever of societal phenomena we're looking to talk about in a, in a thoughtful way, if we're not interested in talking about the ways that our beliefs, our pres presuppositions about race, about how they might distort our view of the world, then we're going to run into all sorts of very important um, challenges. Yeah. Brother, let's talk about fatherhood. You know, mm. I have not forgotten what you said to me, maybe it was yesterday, about fatherhood in Jamaica. Mm. And then I thought about you as a father. <laughs> Give our audience a little bit of background on our conversation as you educated me about what fatherhood is in Jamaica. And then how did that impact you in mm -hmm. becoming a father? Well, I, I wonder if you'd agree with this, Ian. We talked, we mentioned you in that context as well. But, you know, I, m my mother um, had me out of wedlock. 
her, my biological father, she was his second mistress. He had another mistress. I have an older sister who's oh 13 months my senior. And I have two older brothers who are a little bit older than that from the marriage. He was carrying on these relationships unbeknownst to these various women. My mother found out about this while I was in utero. Um, and it, it created a dynamic that is actually pretty familiar to me in a lot of Jamaican families. And I think what I was suggesting was that it is not unusual for there to be communities in Jamaica where there isn't a, a very high kind of social penalty for being a man who fathers a number of children outside of yes. wedlock. And one of my clearest memories of my biological father is perhaps meeting him for the third time. and encounter and this was in Jamaica and him saying to someone who he knew very well it seemed you know this is my youth this is my son his pride around that and and he had tremendous pride tremendous. despite the fact that he hadn't put in any of the work in forging me he didn't know who I was I was I was alien to him I, I distinctly remember him him coming up to me and saying do you know who I am and my response at that time was well you're my stepfather I'd never really thought about the concept of sort of dad and stepfather because I, I was born into a world where I was just with my mom, but my, my stepdad, who I've only ever referred to as dad, was there from about sure. the age of two and a half, three. And he, he fulfilled all of those needs. So I had a man who I called dad. And I imagine that, well, this, this whole step designation, that must mean the guy who like leaves. <laughs> um, mm. And I, I think that that has had a profound impact on the way I think about fatherhood, um, the wonderful gift that I received from my dad who was there, who, who gave to me in ways, and poured into me in ways that I can't imagine would be any different um, had I not been, had I been his biological son. Um, I never felt that there were any sort of lack or defect. Um, but I've thought often about whether or not my biological father like ever experienced the sort of transcendent joy that I have, like watching my two children grow up and, and discover themselves and having this opportunity mm -hmm. to enrich their lives. You know, there was a time as a younger man where there was resentment there. Um, but as an older man, I've had the real opportunity to be to reflect more on what he missed out on. You have empathy for him. Yeah. Because to some degree, what you experience as transcendent joy, for him, it may have just been transactional. Mm. You know? And that, you know, saying to his friend, this is my youth, mm -hmm. in that moment, he has a sense of pride. But as you say, no, none of the deeper appreciation of what it means to be a father. Does that make you... Um, any more empathetic yourself as it relates to issues in the black community in the United States around issues of fatherhood? Well, I'd, I'd probably go broader than that, as is my, my, <laughs> my proclivity. I, I think that in any circumstance where you have communities that don't kind of value the, the, that relationship between father and son, where you have families that are kind of splintered um, because of out-of-wedlock childbirths, there, there does seem to be a pretty meaningful correlation between the, the possibilities for success along a bunch of different dimensions um, that is tightly correlated with whether or not families stay together. And where that is, is not happening in kind of a systematic fashion, um, it's worth being concerned about. And I definitely have, I think, I try to have empathy for anyone who finds themselves in a difficult circumstance, however they manage to find themselves there. But I think what's really important is the kind of work that you do, Ian, where you're at least openly talking about what people are giving up, what they're sacrificing when they don't adhere to this particular norm um, around parentage and fatherhood and being deeply involved in the lives of your children. And I think helping people to understand both the importance of the obligation, but the remarkable gift, um, the opportunity of doing that, that very hard work. And I, we're all dads here. I, I imagine, you know, that we would generally agree with the sentiment that it is you know, among the most difficult and demanding and rewarding and things rewarding. I've ever done. And my daughter, I used to say that she was the best and worst person I'd ever met in my life <laughs> when she was two. I don't say that anymore at four. She's, she's just generally really awesome. Yes. Well, and just, just to drill down a little more on the, on the Jamaican situation, is the assumption that this comes from 
the slave plantation, colonization? What are the assumptions for where this comes from? Is it a, hmm. like in the U.S., there was a lot of discussion during the conference that, you know, the fatherless home is, is something that occurred as we entered the 70s that mm -hmm. really started to exacerbate. What's the dynamic in Jamaica? Hmm. I've, I've never thought about it deeply, to be, to be quite frank. And it's interesting. I mean, I know that there is a tendency, particularly in American politics, and I'd, I'd say largely on the left, to focus in kind of a forensic way on like what caused the car accident. But, you know, you arrive on the scene, there are bodies strewn all over the streets. <laughs> Imagine interrogating this person before you render aid, before you try and support them and help them. And the reality is that, you know, where they were headed at the time isn't ne necessarily nearly as important as kind of the traffic signals and the patterns and the design of the road. But in the immediate moment, the urgent circumstance that needs to be addressed is the, the sort of the deficit, the social, the economic deficit, that carnage that really has to be uh, remedied. And I think that requires honesty and integrity. It does require compassion. Um, and yeah, I think it also suggests that you're giving good advice to young men who are, who are growing up in circumstances where they perhaps might not be as inclined towards those traditional values around building a family in a healthy, sustainable way. I mean, well, so given that, and then given your focus in building media enterprises, um, how important is it that we own these media enterprises, that the narrative and that the communication, the discussion is owned by us and that we have some control over what gets discussed and how it gets distributed. Was that a part of your motivation in creating this company? Well, it's, it's interesting. You use the word us and I'm not, I'm not quite certain what you mean. Well, uh, you could argue that there's a group of people that own traditional media mm -hmm. and they don't look like any of us. Hmm. Uh, and so that, that, that narrative, you know, it's, it, a lot of the discussion in the conference was about how the left is well organized in terms of its ability to get a narrative out to America. Yeah. And to own that narrative. I mean, I'd say that, you know, values supersede any sort of kind of phenotypic traits. I, I think at the end of the day, it is entirely possible to look a particular way or have a particular life experience and arrive at all the wrong conclusions. Oh, exactly. Well, that's, so, my wife so, tells me that all the time. Yes. <laughs> so so I, I do think it's, it's important for there to be a diverse array of people who have voices in media. And yes, I, I think it's terribly important that people who have my ideas um, have a voice in media because I'm right about most things. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say that, you know, at Freethink, um, most of the work that we do is about ideas and innovation. It's people who are building things and solving hard problems. The, the cornerstone of that company is our belief in the, the, the kind of vitalness of human thriving and the need to try to create conditions in a culture that values innovation and progress and isn't driven by kind of cynicism about industry. Um, and there's a sense in which that's very different than a lot of the kind of commentary work that I do in other contexts uh, where I'm talking about, in many instances, race and identity. Um, but I also think that part of what I try to do in the space of race and identity is transcend kind of conventional thinking about race, which is really inherited thinking um, and a pre an appreciation for the fact that race is an endowment that you've received. This, this, it's an, uh, a philosophical endowment, but not every endowment is valuable. It, it does, it is not, let me put stated a different way. Not every endowment is for your benefit. Mm. Sometimes it's a burden. Sometimes there is something there that you need to really grab a hold of and deal with and reorient your relationship to it. And I think that there is, there's, quite a bit of work to do in thinking through our relationship to the ideology of race and whether or not it serves the best interest of the human community more broadly, of Americans in general, of people who self-identify as black and as white. Is that really a great representation of who and what you are, of what your values are? Um, is that what we ought to work towards, understanding one another on the basis of race? Um, or is there something more that we can do? And I think there's a heck of a lot more we can do. 
Very good. I think, uh, Nike, time for the speed round. Very good. Well, <laughs> e each of our guests, we, we, we take a moment to, to offer up um, different philosophies, different individuals, ask you to pick from one or the other, mm. tell us why you selected them, and, and, and to give us some context. So we'll start with our, our classic, which is Malcolm or Martin? Well, definitely Martin. Um, and I, I will say that you know Malcolm was different man at different points in his life. Um, and I, I value the kind of revolutionary zeal that's there, but the enduring legacy of MLK, the resonance of that message, um, which I think it's rooted in empathy. There's there's an honesty there. There's so many transcendent values that, you know, we can all we all continue to celebrate. I think that that it has to be MLK. Um, but as I've, I've become accustomed to saying recently, I think there's a, a sense in which we kind of lean on the fact that he did all of this heavy lifting and that his words still resonate in such a powerful way. It's, that's good, but it's also important to innovate, to think beyond what he gave us. If he aspired to live in a world where black girls and white girls could play together, um, I can aspire to live in a world where we recognize that the notion that there are black girls and yeah. white girls um, is, is outmoded. What he did was remarkable for his time, but in 2022, it it's may be that we further. need a more ambitious vision and goal. Um, and that's my goal. YouTube or Twitter? <laughs> Twitter. Why? Um, I like the conversation that takes place there. Um, I know a lot of people are, are sort of skeptical of the platform. A lot of people use it for bad, for evil, so to speak. Um, but I think that there are plenty of healthy ways to contribute to discussions on that platform. And I've, I've kind of embraced the, the role of trying to be someone who has constructive dialogues on Twitter. I value the stuff that YouTube does as well. I mean, we operate a company that primarily traffics in making premium video content and trying to get it to audiences. Um, but I think there's something unique about Twitter, the way the, the, the micro-blogging format forces you to kind of think in concrete, bite-sized ways. And lastly, uh, entrepreneurship or community development? <laughs> That's a trick question in my estimation. I think entrepreneurship definitely can serve the community. I mean, in a, in a free market, the way that you get ahead is by meeting people's needs. Um, and I think there's plenty of amazing, remarkable work to do that can enrich you personally and that can enrich the lives of your customers and by extension, strengthen communities. So entrepreneurship, build something. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, before we ask you the final question to provide our young 16-year-old uh, Daryl advice, I'm just curious, just related to your last uh, comment about Twitter and the media landscape, you said that you are trying to use it in a holistic, positive way to advance a conversation. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem that that is the norm. So how do you think we can create new norms around the use of social media in particular that would relate to the advancement of all people because it unfortunately seems that the advent of social media has become a source of division, a source of um, uh, sort of isolating yourself only in communities that mm -hmm. are already you know, aligned with whatever your views may be and almost never venture into areas that you disagree. So I'm curious, given your entrepreneurship mm -hmm. in this area. I mean, I think cultural change kind of begins with ourselves. We have to understand what our own values are first. Um, and then I think we have to actually model those things and then defend those principles. Uh, one, one important, I think, philosophical uh, uh, innovation that I've made for myself is understanding that there are certain battles that are never going to be won, certain values that I'm always going to have to defend and that someone else will have to defend long after I'm dead. Like the, the value of free speech, for example, as a cornerstone of a free society, there will always be people who want to undermine it for different reasons. Oftentimes people who might have been your allies in some other context believe, ah, oh, these da these ideas are just too dangerous. Yeah, because now they're saying they're right. Now yeah. there's, yeah, there's free speech only only for the ideas that exactly. I agree with. Exactly, right? yeah, and I, I think that it's it's important enough that I'll always have to defend it, and I'll always have to, to advance it and make an argument, and I, I take, I take great pride in being part of the intellectual tradition um, in whatever small way I am um, of people who appreciate why this is valuable and why this is something that needs to be defended and ought to be defended. 
Wow. Okay. Well, we've come to our final question, which we are always excited by because as, as Nike and I know, we created The Invisible Men way back when because we just thought, you know, we were at Harvard Business School, these black guys who were doing okay, and yet there were young people across the country that had no idea someone like us or someone like you even really existed. Mm. And we wanted to create a platform where we could provide advice to Daryl, you know, 16-year-old kid from Forgotten USA. So I'm curious, Camille, what you would say to the many Daryls out there that are trying to make sense of the world mm -hmm. for them. <clears throat> be curious, and I don't want this to be cliche, but be curious, be brave, um, and don't let anyone else define you. Um, the, the mantra that my, <laughs> my dad had growing up, um, in addition to always telling me, don't, don't take no wooden nickels, was things like, you know, your attitude defines your altitude. Um, and I, my, he, he set a very clear expectation that he wanted me to be a, a leader, which didn't so much mean that I needed to be in charge of everything, but I needed to be responsible for myself. Um, and cultivating a sense of dignity um, and also a sense of my own fallibility and limitations um, is something that I've, I'm, I think has been invaluable um, to the degree I've been successful at whatever I've put my hand to um, and has really been critical to me being what I hope is a good father and a good husband and a good friend. Um, so I think those are, are values and characteristics that can't fail you. Yeah, well, I think... The creation of free think, I think, is an example of how you're trying to create an environment in which people can be free thinkers. Daryl, like the many millions of Daryls around him, are getting lots of messages that mm -hmm. are trying to define him. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, how does Daryl discern? How does he sift through all of these messages to determine the message that is most empowering to him? And so, Camille, thank you for joining us and being part of that force and helping all of us think more clearly to sift through differing ideas to determine what is right and what is wrong. No, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you. Excellent. For uh, other episodes of The Invisible Men, you can go to www.invisible.men. Thank you. As always, a pleasure. Camille, thank you for joining us. Signing off from Old Parkland in Dallas. Thank you for watching another episode of The Invisible Men. You can find other episodes at the AEI podcast channel on YouTube or the website invisible.men or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. 